Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks so much for joining our Dragos Federal webinar series presented for this episode alongside our friends and partners over at MITRE. My name is Chuck Weisenborn. I support the Department of Defense and the Intelligence Community here at Dragos. Been with Dragos for about two years, uh, building the community and just supporting the work that our nation's defenders uh, and their partners are doing in securing both defense critical infrastructure as well as supporting our commercial partners. Additionally, I am a member of the West Virginia Army National Guard, where I support mission assurance efforts that include things like what we would call mission decomposition or mission threat analysis, which uh, turn out to be fairly similar to crown jewel analysis and the methodologies that are used in there. So I'm really excited to, to get to share you know, maybe a few nuggets from both sides of my life with everybody joining this webinar. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to introduce Cedric Carter. Cedric uh, works over at MITRE and supports the Department of Defense. Uh, and honestly, everybody in the world, he's very, very busy and has been a huge contributor to the community over the past years. Uh, Cedric, can you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Awesome. Thank you so much, Chuck. So, hi, I'm Cedric. I actually started my career at Sandia National Labs, uh, where I was mostly focused on threat hunting on enterprise IT systems. Um, and this was around the 2012-2013 timeframe. At the time, I noticed that um, the public and private sector wasn't paying a lot of attention towards securing operational technology. And that really influenced um, my support to really focus in on the OTs and the uh, control systems that enable critical infrastructure. Um, I then transitioned to MITRE um, in 2018, where I basically I've been doing pretty much the same thing, but really focusing it on uh, Department of Defense. Chuck and I actually came in contact uh, during the National Defense Authorization Act. I don't know if you guys remember FY17 EA 1650, um, where Congress uh, basically told DOD to evaluate their defense critical infrastructure. So I've been really involved um, in supporting OSD in regards to that. Um, so within MITRE, I, I lead MITRE's defense critical infrastructure program um, in support of OSD ANS. And I've been having fun ever, uh, since then. I um, have an awesome team of um, pioneers and engineers, and basically it's all for securing our uh, public sector for Department of Defense curriculum infrastructure. So well, thank you, Chuck. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Cedric, for, for being here. We're really glad to be able to do this with you guys. Uh, so we know that we're going to have a lot of great questions coming out of this webinar. And we'd love for everybody to throw in any questions you have into the Q&A section. Uh, our team will follow up uh, after this event with you guys. And especially if it's related to future topics, we're really excited to have this as kind of the start, right, of our work with MITRE in the defense and the intelligence community space. And we'll be continuing to build uh, future topics uh, alongside their team for, I'm sure, many years to come uh, as we all help the, uh, the government and everybody supporting us along the journey. So you know, the topic of this webinar is crown jewel analysis. And Cedric, if you would, Kind of, kind of tell us what do you define as a crown jewel? Thank you so much, Chuck. Um, so before I go, there, I just want to um, emphasize that I've been noticing a lot of organizations putting out materials for crown jewels analysis, and I'm really happy that we were able to essentially put our differences aside to talk about um, how our analysis differ with and how our analysis is also similar, right, which is awesome. Um, it's collaboration um, in itself. But going back to your, your question, MITRE defines a crown jewel as an asset, right, that is a logical or non-logical bearing device whose failure or failure to perform as a tenant causes mission failure, right? So when we talk about critical infrastructure, there's a lot of assets. Um, there's also a lot of components that really reflect hardware, software, and firmware. Um, what our analysis does is it only reflects the components, either it's logical or non-logical bearing that causes mission failure. So if an adversary were to exploit, it's gonna create a lot of havoc um, in terms of mission operations. 
Awesome. Yeah, you know, Dragos, I think, defines things along those same lines. You know, crown jewels are, are critical, you know, components. It could even be data. It could be a communication path, right? We can't forget about the fabric that ties everything together. And then it also could be things like a control interface that actually executes uh, control over components and thus impacts you know, a critical function or a sub-function of a mission set. And at the end of the day, when we're talking, you know, hey, within an environment, you know, what differentiates a crown jewel from just a regular asset? It's exactly like you said, it's, it's that tie to mission, right? It's the fact that without this component, the core functions, right? The things that we have to keep up and we have to keep running um, would not would not be around and it would would cease to to operate. And you know, if we're talking in the defense sector, right, we're talking about mission failure and impacts to mission and our ability to maybe project power somewhere or deliver capability. But I think it's important to note that crown jewels and crown jewel analysis is just as applicable to the uh, to the private sector, right? In terms of how we can analyze an environment to be able to apply resources and to be able to help us prioritize things. And as Cedric and I have been kind of chatting about you know, the process and what crown jewels are, uh, one of the things that that came up just before this call, Cedric mentioned the 2017 National Defense Authorization Act and the 2021 National Defense Authorization Act in Section 1505. We actually have now a congressional requirement to not just conduct analysis of cyber key mission terrain, right? But also report back the status of that. And I think that that loop is going to be very helpful in encouraging people to get after that and, and really conduct these assessments. So, you know, when we're talking about an environment, right, it, it sounds intuitive that identifying crown jewels is important. But I think that there's some, some sub layers below that where you know, people may ask like, why, right? So why, I already have a network map. I already have my risk register, maybe. I'm already tracking some of these things. Why should I do a crown jewel analysis? And I'm gonna take the first stab at this and I'll pass the mic over, over to Cedric. I, I think the great a great example of a crown jewel analysis scenario is what happened over in Germany uh, with their rail system, um, I guess about a month, maybe a month and a half ago now, where an adversary cut both the physically, right, not cyber, physically cut the fiber that was their primary method of control and their secondary method of control, both of which were located, you know, hundreds of kilometers apart from each other. And that communications network stopped the process. And to me, that's a great example of identifying a crown jewel um, and being able to frame it in the lens of an adversary, right? You know, when we're thinking about things within an environment, you know, it's, it should be framed both in terms of a impact emission, but also, you know, from an adversarial standpoint, where would I go, right? If I were trying to do something malicious. Uh, Cedric, uh, you want to you wanna take, uh, you have any other comments on that one? Absolutely. My my brain is going everywhere with that, <laughs> but that is an, a great example. Um, so from my end, uh, one of my sponsors at OSD, Lovedem Dev, he's really imposing and influencing DOD to really adopt the ideas of mission-focused cyber hardening, right? So, you know, given, you know, limited cyber capacity, given a limited budget, right, you know, what things do I need to apply mitigations towards? Because, you know, I think both MITRE and Jaguars can agree, you cannot mitigate and fix everything. You can't, right? But you only should apply your resourcing and fix the things or cyber hardening things that are most influential to your mission operations. That example that you brought up on cutting a wire, it's a great example. So with crown jewels analysis, you can really reflect like out of all the components supporting the infrastructure, what are the components that I really need to focus in on for resi resiliency and mitigations? Um, another thing too, um, and we're gonna get into differences and similarities. Um, so 
We've been applying crown jewels. When I say we might, or we've been applying crown jewels to ICS environments. And we've noticed that in, in a lot of cases, a human can be a crown jewel. Um, and I think with between our assessments, we've noticed that in certain control systems, it can be only dependent on one operator that knows everything about how things operate. And what if that human gets compromised? Bad things happen. So I I love that. Um, yeah, thinking about the the things that sometimes we consider uh, from the people perspective is incredibly, incredibly important. And I would encourage people to think not just about, hey, is 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 it just one is none? But, you know, let's say that something happens and there is a single bridge that people have to get across in order to get to their area where they do their mission. That could present a risk. And it's something that from a you know people and logistical standpoint, if something is that critical, it is a great another great example of of things to kind of watch out for that a lot of people don't think if they're just looking inside the scope of their asset or inside the scope of their of their process. Uh, yeah, as 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 we're we're kind of been talking, I also you know we we focused a lot on kind of during boom and you know kind of right of boom, if you will, right post attack, post incident, but. There's a lot of goodness that crown jewel analysis can bring you from a left of boom or pre-incident. I think one of those, it understanding what an adversary may target and what is critical to our mission and our and its functions, um, really help us build realistic uh, tabletop exercises as opposed to creating scenarios based upon something that's happened in the past, we can incorporate those tactics, techniques, and procedures into a scenario that has been built for our environment based on how somebody might want to attack a crown jewel. Um, we'll I'll show kind of an example of that later on, but you know, the fact that crown jewel analysis can be used both to help us prepare help us be more resilient, right? Identify additional avenues for resiliency and then also help us recover if something does happen. I, I think it's just an incredibly powerful tool um, in everybody's toolbox. And, yeah, so, you know, who all benefits from something like a crown jewel analysis, right? We're, we're talking you know, a lot of focus being being that we're and, you know, being your role in critical infrastructure on control systems and the operational technology space, who else could do crown jewel analysis and who else could benefit in your opinion, Senator? So, you know, I think, so the thing about MITRE's crown jewels, right, it's, it's multifaceted, it's technologically independent, you can apply crown jewels to processes. You can ap apply it to organizations and their decision makings, right? Um, it doesn't just have to be applied to the technical, technological aspects. Um, so I think management can benefit from it. Um, you know, and it also can also benefit the, uh, I guess, getting management to really consult with the actual engineers to actually bridge the gap between how things actually operate and what management thinks how things operate, right? I think it's a great way to give management an understanding from what the operators and engineers have to deal with on a daily basis. Um, it's also great for information exchange. Um, you know, that's another use case, um, as well as just documenting and recording processes. Um, I think um, one of the things that we see a lot in the control system space is a lot of the information of how things operate and work are still embedded in the operator's brains and it's not really recorded on paper. Um, and when that happens, you know, right, uh, there's a lot of manual or manual operating systems that occur and it kind of prevents our ability to automate. If we can record things and toolkits, we can digitally engineer this stuff that allows room for automation. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of use cases for it, uh, but, you know, just to answer your question, it's, it's you know, I, I think, you know, one of the benefits is just priority, 
prioritization of resourcing, right? I think that's that's the primary utilization of the overall analysis. Sure. You know, I, so I started out life as a, as an infantryman, uh, gosh, almost 20 years ago, it'll be 20, 20 years in, uh, in March of next year. And I think back to what it took to get us from point A to point B and then into the foxhole ready to execute a mission. Right. And I think as I you know, think back to the moments that as I've grown up and I've had to do, you know, what the army calls composite risk management assessments on certain activities, I really wish I would have had something like crowd tool analysis methodology, because then I would have been able to see from a system perspective, right? What is it that is going to get me from point A to point B? And, and where are my you know, single points of failure, right? Do I only have one five-ton truck? Do we have only one spare tire? You know, things like that are things that this type of methodology can actually help with, even at that tactical level, even if we're not talking about control systems or critical infrastructure, there's a lot of benefit in multiple different communities about this. And, and I think as I engage, you know, service members, when I go and visit across the army, I think that this is something that I'm going to try to talk about, right, to folks so that they can apply it to real world missions. Um, it'll be really cool to to be able to share that knowledge with people. So from from a, you know, how do we do this and what does it look like? I'm, I'm going to pass the mic over to you and I'm going to advance the slide forward on, you know, kind of discussing on MITRE side, you know, your white paper and the methodology, and then also the definitions, because I think it's important for people to understand, you know, what is a system function in y'all's uh, methodology? What is an operational task? Uh, so Cedric, I'd love to hand the mic over to you just to kind of talk through uh, y'all's CJA process. Awesome, thank you. So what we do is we divide a process into four phases, right? And, you know, really the first phase is the reconnaissance phase. We're gathering information. Um, in a lot of cases, we have to actually create uh, a lot of the information. So for some of our customers, they may not have an inventory list, or they may not have an actual architecture diagram. And what we can do is we can actually conduct a site tour and basically record and actually produce those artifacts for them that would then be used for the overall analysis. But really it starts with information exchange, right? Uh, so information can come from actual site tours where we're actually tracing wires, right? We actually trace wires in a lot of cases. Um, I think, um, and I can just, you know, imagine what Dragos has to go through. I think you guys get a lot of artifacts of what organizations think was in their environment. And then when you guys go on site, it's much different. <laughs> So what needs to happen for our analysis is we actually trace wires um, via site tours. Um, we get information from inventory lists. Uh, we also get information from the actual SMEs uh, from various perspectives, right? We're actually interviewing the engineers, the operators, the technicians, and management. So we're more objective with our reasoning, so it's not as subjective. And we like to fuse their, what they think, how things operate. So, you know, we come out with a more objective analysis. Um, so what it is, is it has four levels of dependencies, right? Um, so, um, and we do this via, you know, four levels. So there's, you know, a asset can have total mission failure, significant degradation, uh, our partial capability loss or just no loss at all. An asset, again, could be logic or non-logic bearing, right? So it could be, and you brought up great examples, um, you know, before, it could be an HMI, it could be an actual software, it could be a human, right? It can be an actual network switch, right? It could be an actual physical line, right? We consider those as assets. Um, a system function are the things are the definitions of what that asset enables. And, you know, it's basically verbose text, if you can imagine, but what we do is we like to digitize it and we create linkages. So per an asset, what kinds of things does that asset enable? 
right? And we're tracing that. We're actually, we're digitizing this um, in, a, in our actual CJA toolkit. So that's the system function. You know, it's the, the profile of what an asset can bring within the actual control system. An operational task, um, those are, in other words, human tasks. What do humans do or how do they take, you know, uh, you know, the actual system in support of mission? So, you know, another way to look at it conceptually are human tasks. From an operational standpoint, what are humans doing with the varying system functions to support mission? All right. Those are human tasks. And then mission objectives, basically that's the bluff of the control system, right? So if we're talking about, um, you know, uh, electrical power distribution system, it could simply be enabling electricity for asset X, right? Um, for some of our missions, uh, people consider safety as being an actual mission, right? Um, so if you can imagine, right, this dependency graph gets super complex and we encapsulate all that information within a toolkit. Um, and per each of the tiers, we basically go through theoretical failures. What happens if the specific missions were to fail, right? What's the impact on the operational task? And we do the same thing with the operational task tier, right? If an, if an operational task were to fail, what's the impact to the system function, right? Same thing with the system function, right? You know, if a system function were to fail, what's the impact to the asset? And we do that in reverse. Going through that process, if we're able to trace uh, an actual total mission failure or just a failure through all the tiers, all the way down from um, the mission objectives down to the asset, you've identified a crown jewel. Thanks. I, I think that was a really, really great run through of, of y'all's methodology. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's no surprise that the way that y'all have things diagrammed out is, is very similar to the methodology and, and the visualization, right. That we would do, um, as mission assurance professionals, right. In my, in my other role. As I review, as I kind of read through y'all's white paper, you know, some of the things that that really struck struck out and kind of stood out to me were the fact that assets are very broadly defined, which I think is a great thing because you're exactly right. You know, it allows you to conceptualize that an asset may not be a piece of infrastructure. It could be a person. It could be, you know, a data source. It could be things like that, right? And I think that this is where, you know, kind of the Dragos methodology and the Meyer methodology differs because Dragos is only focused on industrial control systems and operational technology from a cyber lens. Um, we tend to look at um, systems a little bit differently and just in a little bit different perspective. And, and as we, and as I kind of, laid the the two methodologies side by side in my opinion it's actually very complementary to each other because we've got this very holistic very system of system view that the miter methodology is providing and then we are leveraging that if say an asset right down at the bottom is a control system we can then kind of leverage the dragos methodology right to even go further down and understand even further, right? What um, what that system does and what the act key components inside of maybe something are, and that that's really exciting to me. And I think there's also opportunities where you know maybe something gets identified as an asset um, through the miter methodology. Maybe even going up from the perspective that we use is, is also a fairly interesting conversation. So it'll be fun to explore this over over the next couple of months. When we talk about you know crown jewels from from a Dreos perspective, again, we're coming at this from a from a lens of the operational technology control system specific cyber world. 
So as we are helping you, know, like you said, build build the community and build knowledge sharing within organizations and getting those kind of nuggets and learning how how things you know, truly work, right? Boots on the ground because if you're not physically there, you're you're not getting the the whole story. I think when you're trying to do something like this, um, we we start out, you know, actually even above critical system or subsystem with the system owner and the functional output of the system. And that's important to capture because when you start looking at, hey, how do we use this methodology to enable things like tabletop exercises, understanding the output helps you understand what the actual mission objective of that system is, right? So I think that that tier in, in our kind of methodology and framework really aligns very well to that. And then as we drop down into determining, you know, okay, for that functional output to realize, what are the critical systems or subsystems that uh, provide a collective function and output that then help the, the higher tier, right, realize the overall output? And then dropping one layer below that, it's identifying the... Uh, critical function, subfunction of that critical system. And then as we kind of drill down, now we've started identifying critical components of a critical function. And then this is really where I think things get interesting for us. We then look at, okay, well, for that critical component, what is actually putting it under control? What is the system or device that is causing that thing to do its job to turn the what is the controller that turns the motor right what is the human machine interface that somebody would push and then if we're you know we then look you know really at the controller level and we go down another step okay hey for that controller to function what are the devices that are going to feed into that right or what are maybe some of the you know, pieces that are feeding information into that controller for it to make a decision. Uh, and so that's where I think, you know, kind of our our alignment becomes very interesting and very intriguing to me in that we, we get to have this conversation about, you know, people and data and communications. Mm -hmm. But then when we hit, oh, hey, this is a piece of operational technology control system. Now we've got a way to actually go even further, right? Um, and that's that's really exciting to me. I'd, I'd love to hear any any thoughts you have about that and about our process compared to to y'all's. So what's happening within the modern corporation? Um, you know, folks folks want to go deeper. Um, you know, and I can really see us you know partnering up and just producing materials on how we're similar and how you know we're actually different. I actually had um, one of the questions from one of the guys actually lead. Crown Jewels analysis, you know, from MITRE and how he was looking at it. And this is a question. So from him, um, his name is Bill Heinbachle. He's actually one of my mentors uh, on applying Crown Jewels to industrial control systems. Um, he's considering, and I think maybe you can answer this, right? He's considering the last three tiers as an asset. Is that true? So how I'm looking at it, right? You have critical components, right? So the components that basically make up an asset, you know, whether that's hardware, software, you know, from where you have the controllers, um, and then you also have the actual crown jewel, right, depending on how deep you go. From his perspective, he looks at those three tiers as an asset. Um, what do you think about that? Um, do you agree? Do you, thoughts? Yeah, so, so, so I think that 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 that's kind of where I'm leaning towards in part, right? So I'm thinking back to when when I've conducted these types of, of analyses and, and kind of the dividing line between going further, right? And then kind of staying a little bit more um, operational as opposed to, you know, like, all the way tactical, right? When it comes to examining a system. Um, and I, I see that 
line almost right as kind of where our where our two methodologies line up Mm -hmm. And, and not to say that that you guys don't aren't going deep enough i think that when we look at assets right the granularity there when we are trying to sort through how an adversary would cause an impact i i think really does require those those bottom three right mm-hmm. tiers right so so yeah i think i think maybe you're we're, we're, you're you're onto something you guys are, are onto something and hey how do we how do we expand this out yeah. it, just keeping in mind though that you know the dreos methodology is focused strictly on op, on control system and operational technology um, I think it could be very interesting to talk about um, in this, this that wouldn't necessarily be a Drago's conversation, right? But talk about, well, what does that look like when you draw that out for the the people part of the equation, right? There could be some really fascinating conversations and I think some really interesting things that, that can come out of those types of discussions um, mm-hmm. when we're talking about conducting these uh these analyses and from the oh go ahead i'm sorry (laughs) sorry um like from the meta perspective you know the the you know how the answer the question how far deep deep do we go right you know like do we go to the actual actuator um that's actually enabled the actual control system like all those are really informed by the end customer, right? So you may have some customers that want to keep it the analysis super broad, but you may have some customers that want to keep it super specific. Um, so I say all that to say that the you know um, depending on how how far up or how deep we go is really dependent on this uh, that the actual customer and scoping is also very critical as well. Because yes. if you scope too tactically, obviously that's going to create temporal effects on the overall analysis. It's going to take a lot of time. <laughs> but if you're super vague, it may shorten the time window of the overall analysis. So it just depends. Yeah, and, and I think also it depends on the uh, criticality of the asset that we're looking at. But then also, you know, a couple other factors, things like, hey, if, if this asset goes down, how long before it say impacts a mission or that functional output and then also how how long before we can repair it because if the time to repair is shorter to the time to impact well now maybe we reevaluate you know this asset as a true crown jewel yes it's important but we have things in place that will make that you know resilient um and I agree with you on the scoping. Scoping is always tough. Scoping is extraordinarily difficult when you're when you're trying to figure out, you know, how low do I go? And that's where I think really bringing in kind of that, you know, most likely course of action for an adversary and the most dangerous course of action that an adversary could exploit really kind of come into play because it helps you guide where you're going to spend your time. And you do have to be careful because you can absolutely, bias can creep into this process really easily in those spots. And that's why it's great to have somebody who is from, say, you know, if you're in the defense community, bring in somebody from the intel side of the house um, and maybe bring in somebody who maybe is a more neutral third party, right? That that can help kind of provide just a, just another perspective on what you're looking at to make sure that we don't go too far. I know I'm, I'm guilty of that as, as much as anybody, um, because I love exploring how things are working and how their interdependencies are happening down to the, to the very, very small level. And sometimes it's just not appropriate. I think one of the other interesting things that, you know, as we're talking about you know, kind of outcomes of like a crown jewel analysis and some other interesting things. You know, I didn't bring this up earlier as a benefit, but talking about supply chain and understanding, right, what components, right, are are critical is a very interesting conversation when you're looking at, say, a manufacturing plant, right, where one bolt is the key piece of a key component versus when you're looking at maybe a vehicle or another system that has you know larger blocks if you will 
So I, I think that there are some probably some probably really interesting discussions to be had around how do we help people scope? That could be a fantastic area um, to talk about maybe in a in a future webinar down the road. Um, it, and that also, I think, kind of ties into, you know, hey, what if what if we're kind of starting on our journey, right? So in in your kind of observation and the places that you've seen and gone, wh where are most organizations in their OT cybersecurity journey, right? Are they just starting out? Are they, you know, really getting after the problem? And does this cause, is this too complex for people to achieve? I don't think so. So <laughs> to answer your question, they're everywhere. Um, you also have to, I think you know this, right? You, you got to consider kind of like the history of how things were designed, right? You know, especially from sure. a control system con context, things were designed to work. People at the time, right, we're talking like 30, 50, 70 years, security wasn't really a big deal, especially in a cyber context. They just wanted things to work. I need power. I need cooling, right? I need, you know, pumping of fuel. I need that up and running. <laughs> um, and then our threats noticed that, oh, these systems are, you know, your unbearing systems that I don't necessarily have to, you know, launch a missile. I can use, you know, light to contest these systems and I get my desired effect. That's when we started to really focus in on cyber. And it's putting us in a more reactive state. Um, but, you know, just, 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 Getting to your question, I don't think it's complex. What we've done, um, and I'm, you know, very fortunate that the Navy um, has actually allowed MITRE to really experiment with the applications of Crown Jewels. So, special shout out to NAFAC. Um, so, if you know a customer is super busy, right, there's an opportunity to just eavesdrop on their operations. Just watch you can gain a lot of information where you're just not interrupting um, their operations because at the end of the day, these guys are busy. Their job is to make sure things are available up and running at all times. And, you know, the worst you can do is just take, you know, 30, 15 minutes out of the time just to just query them on your information. You can just eavesdrop and just gain intel and just record. You can basically watch and just see what they see you can actually gain information. And then later on, you can validate what you've seen uh, to just to ensure, you know, that you're tracking. Sure. I, I think it's, I think that kind of ties into having and, and then the importance of having a cross-functional team, right? That comes from different areas of the organization. Because when we talk about, you know, the different types of artifacts that we want to see coming into a crown jewel analysis. You know, if you're a traditional IT person, a network engineer, or, or even a traditional IT cyber person, you may not know what a process hazard analysis is, right? You may not know how to read a piping and instrumentation diagram. Um, you may not know to ask for something like a hazard and operability study or you know failure mode and effects analyses or the things that are common in common terminology within the engineering community that you know folks coming in from IT or folks that are coming in from outside of that organization um, may just not know exist. I've seen this a lot when I've uh, educated people about the mission assurance community in the defense department Sometimes people don't know that these types of assessments have already been conducted and that they're available. You just have to know the right questions to ask sometimes. And I think knowing those questions um, is only done by having more voices and a diversity of thought and experience you know, on a team that is uh, supporting a client or a customer or a partner. Um, I, I think the other interesting thing is we're talking about this and, and we're talking about, you know, hey, this this is an opportunity to really help everybody within an organization from management all the way down to the engineer learn about the different aspects of the business. How do you see something like a CJA 
helping people actually mature their cybersecurity programs? Good question. Imagine if crown jewels analysis were done before assessments were undergone just to help the scoping, right? Um, you know, what we're seeing in assessments, people try to boil the ocean and we're trying to assess everything and not, not everything may, may not be important, right? Um, I can really see crown jewels analysis really, um, really increasing the cyber hardening strategies for resiliency because you're only focusing on the things that are important. Um, but, you know, I love the use case that you brought up on essentially leveraging it on uh, cyber tape exercises. Imagine if a uh, small or short scale crown jewels analysis was done before a cyber tape exercise, right? That would be great. Imagine if it was done before a war game, right? That would really help, you know, assessors really focus in on the things that are actually important still instead of boiling the ocean. But then it's like you're also bringing in the more objective reasoning, right? You know, I'm attacking this because you know, the management, engineers, and technicians all said that this thing was important. <laughs> so, you know, folks aren't fighting. Well, why did you focus in on that? Why didn't you focus in on the, the, the that, that, that other thing? Um, so it it's multifaceted, Chuck. I can see this really benefiting um, um, a lot of things. And it also really gets that, um, you know, kind of validating, you know, putting your dollars worth, you know, things are actually important in supporting your mission, right? So it's like you're sure. benefiting from the return on investment. Um, a lot of cases, folks are just spending because they need to spend, especially in a nonprofit context, right? But Crown Jewels, you know that you're spending your dollars towards the things that are, are mission focused. So you have that you know, reinforced learning or that reinforced validation that I know that my dogs are going towards the things that are actually mission critical or mission important. So I, I think about the, the NIST cybersecurity framework, right? And, and I love, I love that document and I love the, the framework that it provides people and the flexibility that it provides people. And the first stop is identify, right? Because if you don't know what you have and how it works, you're going to have a really difficult time determining what is important to monitor, what is important to include in re targeted response planning, and then what is important and where protection should be applied. And, and so I think, you know, as a foundational tool, I really see Crown Jewel Analysis as a foundational tool, right? It's kind of like one of those first stops in your journey. And when you talk about how does this align to assessment methodologies and the assessment community that we have today, I think it gives us a better way to use our time. And I say that because if we have a crown jewel analysis document in our hands coming into a site or a facility, now instead of doing all of that legwork ourselves, we can do confirmation and provide another opinion and then start looking at the, the things that are further down the chain, right? That may be interesting and unique to say the defense department or the federal government um, and really make ourselves part of the, and I'm saying ourselves is like the assessment community, right? Part of our partners, cybersecurity programs, instead of, this kind of third wheel parachute in from above kind of experience that I think we're giving to people today, right? We can help people refine their processes, but all that hinges on folks understanding how to do things like conduct a CGA and hopefully this webinar will kind of get, get folks at least started down that pathway. And we've got some resources at the end that will provide everybody. So I'd like to kind of, See, if, Cedric, if you wouldn't mind walking us through maybe a example, right, from y'all's perspective of a crown jewel analysis, and then I'll do also do one, you know, kind of from the Drago's perspective, just so people can kind of hear, you know, what types of components, what types of functions are we talking about um, in, in a couple of different lenses, if that's okay. Absolutely. So thank you for, you know, bringing that up. So, you know, what, what we're seeing is, 
an example of, you know, this uh, conceptual example of uh, electrical distribution system, right? So, you know, within an electrical distribution system, there's a lot of components, you know, all the way down to the actual circuit breakers, to the PLCs, to the actual physical line, to the substations, OTIT gateways, it's just a lot of things that enable electricity, right? So, you know, if we're looking at the asset level, it could be just those things. It could be an OTIT gateway uh, that basically, um, you know, provides pivotal support for going from IP to serial, vice versa. It could be a main switch. It could be a substation. It could be an operator workstation. It could be a human, right? I've seen cases where electrical system could be supplied by only one stacker and that he knows everything. What happens if he gets compromised, right? <laughs> He's an actual crown jewel. Um, so those are your assets, right? Now, you know, as we're going up, if you could think about each of those assets, if you can just enumerate on what that asset enables, what does it provide? Like, what is its purpose, right? Those are your edges. So then you go into the system functions. How are those edges used in the operational context, right? So if we're talking about an OTR, uh, OTIT switch or something that enables telecommunications from a, you know, an actual, from a power distribution standpoint, it's the thing that's providing connectivity, right? You need connections, right? You need telemetry for your SCADA systems. Um, you need telemetry for your actual PLCs. You need comms, <laughs> comms are very important. And, you know, for going, was it 2022? Comms are becoming, you know, relayed in the RF spectrum, right? I can really see comms from an electrical distribution system being communicated wirelessly, right? So that could potentially be a system function. Uh, but from a PLC standpoint, it could just be polling process OT data. So those are your system functions. And, you know, there's, depending on the scoping, it could be, you know, you can enumerate down that down to the n minus one order, but those are your functions. But as we keep going up, you know, we're getting more operational, right? From a human perspective, how are people, humans using those system functions to support mission? So, you know, from an operator that, you know, his responsibility is to ensure SCADA is up and running and to report to utilities and to his management, he's monitoring the distribution status, right? And he's really leveraging the SCADA systems from his peripheral view uh, just to ensure things are up and running at all times. So if there's an outage, he's gonna use that SCADA HMI UI to ensure things are up and running, right? That could be an operational task. Another operational task could be dispatching personnel out to a field for troubleshooting, right? Um, so there can be a lot of operational tasks that leverage system functions. And then we keep going up. What are the mission objectives? You could take a mission, you can subdivide that up into actual um, nodes, right? And some of those nodes are, you know, relatively outweighing other nodes. So it could be providing quality services. And a lot of uh, power distribution systems, quality, it could be an actual mission, providing quality power, right? Uh, could be, you know, an actual mission for certain organizations if they're trying to get to the zero emission spectrum, right? Uh, it could be providing reliable services. It could be providing safe services. Some organizations safety is more critical than other organizations, right? But out of all those organizations, if we're talking about a power distribution system, <laughs> if you look at all of them, they all have one thing in common, providing electrical services, right? That's your pivotal, I guess, note that's common across all the organizations. The point of the matter is we're literally digitizing or we are, I guess, recording these processes into a digital model, right? So, and it really helps with automation. It helps with resiliency. It also helps with when people go off on and they take vacation or they retire, like all that core knowledge is coming from a human, you're digitizing that. And that really increases your resiliency moving forward. Now, going back to the crown jewels analysis process, we theoretically fail each of the tiers to identify what's important. So we fail the operational task, right? Out of all the operational tasks, 
what's the impact to mission operations? And we keep going down. Out of all the system functions, if we were to fail a specific mission function, what's the impact to the human task? And then we keep going down from the asset. If we fail each of the assets, what's the impact to the system functions? If you can trace and specific failure from asset to uh, mission operations, if you can trace that down, that asset is by definition a crown jewel. And it's a thorough process and it's not informed by a SME, you're actually bringing in the technicians and operators of management and you're fusing all their peripherals to ensure you have a more uh, objective reasoning, right? Uh, behind your crown jewel. So it's not just informed by SME, by their anecdotal experience. You're getting like all these perspectives um, into this, you know, one cohesive an analysis. And that's what makes the overall sure. analysis beautiful. So, so it's interesting, you know, as when you started talking, you actually went from the bottom up. Is, in y'all's kind of lens, is that where you typically start? Or do you guys sometimes start like top down, more top funnel down. style? Okay. So we start top down and it also depends on scope. So, and it also, so there's a lot of things and, you know, and this is why if you're talking about control systems, you have to be versatile. <laughs> so what if, what if you don't have uh, inventory list where you're going into crown jewels analysis, you may have to start top down. What if you're given an inventory list, you can start bottom up and start, you know, and we're coring, but you know, going back to your comment, it's always good to start top down, right? And it helps with scoping. If you start bottom up, that's just going to prolong the overall analysis. Yeah, ab absolutely. You know, on the on the Drago side of the house, as we look at you know how we conduct um, crown jewel analysis, I'll, I'll walk through kind of the scenario that that this case study was was based off of, and the system itself and the the system owner is a public water utility the the critical um, functional output of that system is water right treated uh usable water and as we drop down we we've identified a few critical systems that enable the delivery of water right so one of those is reclamation um, one of those may be, uh, say the waste, you know, the wastewater plant. One of those may be the water distribution system. And one may be kind of the, to the house delivery system. In this case, we're focusing in on the reclamation process. And then as we step down and we start talking about, uh, well, what does, what encompasses water reclamation, right? So that utility has a requirement to do things like um, receive water in and do um, do treatment and pump and aerate. Uh, there's a, quite a few bits and pieces of that process that all tear up into the water reclamation critical system. And when we kind of tap, take a step even further, we start looking at the critical components. So if we're just looking at, let's say, aeration and treating, we may have a set of blowers that supply oxygen, that um, help create turbulence in the mixture to get things moving and kind of force things to the top or to the bottom, right? And we may have supporting something like those blowers say electrical power systems and in some cases you might consider that as a you know kind of a subcomponent of the blowers in this case we're looking at it as its own critical component because that electrical system uh supplies power to other aspects of the process as well and then when we look further down in the methodology and we look at the controller level, well, now we've identified a few key programmable logic controllers, right? One that controls the electrical utility side of the house for this facility. And then four, one each assigned to each of the blowers that support that component of the uh, aerating process. 
And so when we look at those controllers and we start looking at, okay, well, which of these are crown jewels and which of these are maybe just, you know, important, but not necessarily critical. And we start looking at what other systems that are touching these controllers are important. We discover that, you know, okay, hey, there are two workstations that interact with these programmable logic controllers that without, we can't control the process or we can't make changes in the case of an emergency. We may also find something like a human machine interface, right? We could find something like a safety instrumented system that is built to ensure water that is contaminated doesn't leave the facility and go downstream into the distribution system. Um, and then we may also find that, hey, for the electrical system, and this is where things I think are absolutely fascinating too, um, we may find that a third party may be a crown jewel of our system. A, an external energy provider may be critical to this entire operation working. And now we have an opportunity to, you know, if we're talking from a defense public-private relationship standpoint, now we've got a great opportunity where we have something that's important that is supported by public infrastructure uh, or privately held infrastructure, right? That we can go have a conversation with from a protection standpoint and learn more about, you know, the people that are enabling us uh, to do our jobs and to execute our missions. So that's kind of the, the Dreos process. Um, and again, when we, when we really overlay it and, and look at how we complement each other, I think that there's so much, there's a lot of similarity, right? And there's some stages that sound a lot like each other. Um, but there's also, you know, like you said, kind of an expanded view of the asset tier, the asset layer when we're talking about control systems, which is really where Dragos is focused. Any uh, any comments on on kind of how Dragos kind of walks walks the dog on uh, CJ? No comments. Um, so, like one of the things that I appreciate, it's like you guys are. In case me if I'm wrong, you guys are kind of like profiling the system owner and you're like you're just you're booking in all the things that the system owner cares about right um and it's like if you think about it you can have multiple system owners depending on your organization right so i can depending on an organization i can see multiple upside down uh pyramids <laughs> um and i'm wondering so, and this is a question, has Dragos created any dependencies on those upside down triangles, right? If you're, if because ideally, right, you can have multiple system owners within an actual organization, they may have some, some dependencies um, they, that an organization may re rely on. And I'm wondering if those dependencies may be critical to, to organization. Um, has, Dragos considered that, or is that in scope? So, so I think I think that question is a scoping question, right? Typically, when we're looking at um, conducting a crown jewel analysis, right, it's within the bounds of an asset owner, right? And if we find something that is interesting, right, that may relate to a third party, we'll highlight that, right, as as part of kind of the the analysis process, and then you know. It, it's not, it may not be in scope of the engagement typically, right? Because we're, we're very finely tuned to, to what we're focused on. Um, I think that that conversation from a defense standpoint is fascinating. We start talking about, you know, things that may have impacts to multiple strategic mission sets, or maybe it's something that, you know, we haven't explored before. And we're we're finding out that, you know, oh wait, we have this dependency that's over here that you know we we need to kind of poke at a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, I think the mapping of this and the visualization of this will be will be a wonderful um a wonderful thing in the in the future for for organizations, um, especially in the federal government. Especially if you're talking about I forgot what year it was, OD and I published um, a paper that talked about how certain threats are literally mapping are critical infrastructures, right? 
So for Takuma organization, organization, you know, is composed of multiple control systems, right? Each of those control systems can have their sets of crown jewels. I just have to really not poke at, but what are the things that's going to cause cascading effects uh, across multiple control systems? Sure. You know, I, I, I think that that's, that that's a great, a great avenue and a great, a great area that we need to focus. And that's, that's actually tied into kind of this slide, right? So when we're talking about scoping and we're talking about, you know, both during and kind of post conducting a crown jewel analysis, understanding what adversaries can do, what they have done, and given your protection posture and detection posture, what you can detect, can prevent, or can respond to, and really of those two, can detect and can respond are the, the two most important pieces, right? I think that becomes a very valid conversation, especially when we're talking about operating underneath constrained resources, not having a whole lot of budget and, and needing to focus on things where we can make gains and drive understanding quickly. And, and so I think that having that intelligence piece, especially for the for the federal government, is incredibly important. We've got to know and we've got to be able to share those types of things. Um, both within ourselves and out to the people that are enabling our missions. And there's been a lot of great work uh, between CISA and folks like the NSA Collaboration Center, right, that are that are helping drive some of those efforts. And I, I applaud those guys and, and thank them for everything that they're doing for the community, right, on a daily basis. It's really amazing. I think the other interesting things from a from a you know kind of finishing out perspective. INL, I know National Lab has done amazing work building two methodologies, one of which, um, as we're talking about, you know, kind of crown jewel analysis and then architecting cybersecurity around something that may already be in place um, is, is more focused in the consequence driven cyber informed engineering realm, I think. And there's there's great there's great resources out there from INL. There's companies that are actually getting certified, um, and you know I think granting a license to use the methodology in their practice business practices, which is awesome. It's great to see the the sharing again. The sharing there is just is just really cool right now. But then I look at the flip side, right, and I look at the impact, right. Once we understand what a crown jewel is and what impacts it could have. Now we can also, we could both do CCE, but we can also bring consequence informed engineering, CIE, to the table to maybe look at, hey, is it more economical to engineer out an impact, even if it's an existing system? It may be possible if it's something like reducing the size of a um, you know, bucket of chemicals or whatnot, a container of chemicals or water, right? Um, there could be some really interesting things done and it all hinges off of knowing what's important and knowing what the impacts could be and then understanding those adversary pathways those most the most dangerous course of action that could impact our asset the worst and the most likely based on what an adversary could or could not do. Um, I think that there's some really cool stuff that could be explored. And again, I, I got to give a shout out to INL for both CCE and CIE. Great job for those. I also want to give a shout out to, uh, to Idaho National Labs. And I also see a lot of alignment um, from this with how MITRE does uh, or how they use uh, crown jewel analysis. It's all threat and form defense, right? So it's like after you've identified your crown jewels or the things that are actually important, what we like to do is we like to overlay the attack framework. The attack framework is informed by Intel, right? Um, but we then really ask ourselves from a threat perspective, right? What can a, you know, a threat actor do to contest or to exploit the crown jewel, right? Using world world Intel, right? After you've reflected that, as we know, um, each of the TTPs within attack has an associated list of mitigation strategies. Now you have to ask yourself out of my limited budget, <laughs> what mitigations can I impose to make it harder on adversary? So I see a lot of alignment, Chuck. 
Yeah, and, and and I would put stop, you know, talking about the the attack framework, both attack non ICS and the attack framework for ICS. It we've got to use those ter that terminology and that lexicon so that we are talking about the same things and that as we're doing things like data sharing, we're talking the same language. So I think that's incredibly important. It continues to be a body of work that gets updated and is a great thing for the community. So I know we're at, we're at time. Um, we do have a collection of resources for folks on crown jewel analysis, including uh, a couple of papers and blogs that Dragos has published. MITRE's uh, crown jewel analysis for ICS white paper uh, is forthcoming and it will be shared with the community, I'm sure, very, very soon. Um, and just to close this up, I, I'd really, from my, from my point of view, really like to thank Cedric and the entire MITRE team for driving this conversation. I think it's going to generate a lot of action, right? Like that's the important thing. We've talked a lot about doing things, but having methodologies that are actionable at all levels of mission and organization, I think really will will help the community out. And so Cedric, thank you, sir, for, uh, for joining us. And did you have any uh, closing comments? No, um, just wanted to uh, really send a special shout out to Rosalie McQuay, Marie Collins, Bill Heinbockel, Peter Kirchner, Michelle Carlson for just mentoring me on Crown Jewels um, and just really um, um, training my brain to apply it to ICS environments. And also Chuck, thank you for having me um, and to drive this conversation. Um, you know, I think we're action oriented. <laughs> let's, let's stop talking and let's, let's do. <laughs> thank you so much. Fourth and do. That's it. Well, appreciate everybody for, for joining us today. Again, uh, if you have any other questions, I'm sure the Q&A block will be up for a little while. Uh, we'd love to to get those and, and answer them after the, uh, the webinar shuts off. So appreciate everybody joining us today and uh, have an awesome day and a great week and a happy holidays to everybody out there.